You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listeners. My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as from the ever-exciting, ever-engaging network, at least we hope so. If I sound a little bit different this week, it's because I'm coming at you not from our Chicago studios, but from here in the Southern studio, Nashville, for the Options Industry Conference. So it should be some great guests rotating through the studio. Next up, we have our old friend, Mr. Jim Toes, the president and CEO over there at Securities Traders Association. Jim, welcome back to Options Insider Radio, sir. It has been too long. It has been a while, but thanks thanks for having us on today. We're looking forward to having a, con- a lively conversation on some topics that we enjoy talking about in this great setting of Nashville, Tennessee. Yes, it is a fun setting here. But obviously, this is the Options Conference. You're yes. a securities guy. What brings <laughs> you to our neck of the woods, sir? What brings you down to OIC this year? Yeah, well, I got, you know, it's, it's funny to see. I mean, you know, we have a 90 year history and, uh, 80, the first 80 was probably just in equities, right? So around 10, 10 years ago, uh, we made a real conscious effort to, uh, get more involved in the option space. And it was kind of, it was a very natural, um, natural transition. We had a lot of, we have an affiliate in Chicago. It's one of the largest ones. So we had a lot of members who are in the options industry. And then there were a lot of things going on on the regulatory front, you know, uh, you know, equities, a lot of regulation, and equities, a lot of history with it. Um, and then in options, what we were kind of seeing is that what we call like the equitization of the options marketplace, whereas regulators were kind of looking at the options market structure that they wanted to, they didn't understand something. They wanted to kind of put an equity centric rule or cookie cutter over the marketplace. And it seemed like the options folks were not very happy about that. And they were looking for a, uh, a vehicle or a means to express that opinion. So we were fortunate to be in that in that position to help them out. Well, it seems like these days, Jim, everyone has an opinion on all things zero day. It's all the rage here at the conference. It's all anyone can talk about. I'm curious for you. Uh, these are still obviously early days for all things zero day, but what are you guys thinking? What are you seeing over there at STA when it comes to this New phenomenon sweeping the nation. So listen, we're, like a, we're very much in, in the discovery mode and listening mode on it right now. Um, some things that from a that seem um, it does seem that these conversations that are being had on the topic uh, are being had by government agencies that maybe are not you know used to kind of looking at these types of issues like the Treasury Department and the Fed. Um, so that's obviously gets people a little bit alarming when, when the treasury kind of knocks on a broker dealer's door to ask them some questions around these products. And the same thing with the Fed. That's usually not a knock that a broker dealer normally gets on it. And then some of the reporting from what, you know, I'm just going to go on what people who are a lot smarter than I am say about it. But some of the reporting that's been done on it uh, has been a little salacious and maybe not as accurate as, as it should be that this, that, you know, this has been going on for a considerable time and that there is no 
uh, systemic risk necessarily present here. But but listen, you know, down in D.C., as you know, they're not the most brightest group of people down there. And when they hear things like options, they think derivatives and then they think leverage and then they think volatility and then they think systemic problems. So, you know, this is going to have to probably play itself out and it needs a good strong dose of education. Well, you mentioned the R word, regulation. I know when you're not talking to me, Jim, that's kind of a big focus for STA. You guys are down in D.C. after all. So when you're not fixated, we're not down here talking about all things zero day. What's top of mind for you and your members over there at STA right now? What are the cutting edge regulatory issues that are really driving your day to day over there? Right. So, so you know, obviously we have a, uh, a new uh, chairman of the House Financial Services Committee and Patrick McHenry. Um, we also had the SEC drop four rather significant rule proposals in early December. They, they kind of bunched all together. It's the equity market structure rule proposals. We don't. I don't think you want to get into into the details on all four of them. But what I will say is that uh, around a week and a half ago, excuse me, a week ago, um, they did have Chairman Gensler appear before the House Financial Services Committee, and I will say that for the first time that I've been. Uh, there was strong bipartisan opinions that the chairman's uh, agenda is very overly ambitious and they are trying to somewhat get him to slow down on his agenda that he has here. So that that seems to be a lot of the conversations here is that we do have a uh, this House Financial Service Committee that on both both sides of the aisle have have some concerns of the with the aggressiveness and the ambition of this chairman's agenda. So we're hoping to uh, see if that can kind of slow him down a little bit. It does seem like Gensler certainly struck a chord with a lot of people recently, and and maybe not in the exact chord he was hoping for. You're right. We don't usually see a lot of unanimous opinion (laughs) out there in the markets, in the political spectrum. It does seem like a lot of people came down on the not exactly enthusiastic response side uh, for what Gensler had to say, especially when it came to crypto. I know you guys have been dipping your toes in crypto a little more over there at STA. What did you and your members have to think about his somewhat strident comments in that area? Yes, I think when we look at crypto, obviously when we say crypto, it means a lot of different, it means a lot of different things, right? So I think where we kind of look at, where we kind of approach this or look at it is one through, I know it's going to sound a little strange, but through stable coins, because to us, that's, that's somewhat of a topic that we can kind of understand, you know, um, uh, and then you know this you know because we do think that obviously you know, there's a lot of power to be had with having a you know a digital wallet and a stable coin to the people out there that you know it, it's it's amazing how many people either don't have a bank account or are underbanked but yet they have a cell phone so you can see the power of like a, a, of what a digital wallet and a coin could do for some for people uh, in in that regard on it so we are we're naturally curious to follow it listen the big thing though here that where he gets the biggest criticism is that on the one hand, he says that there are rules already in place that these entities, whether it's a, a you know, a, a platform or, or, you know, a cryptocurrency, a digital asset or a platform that trades them, that there are already rules of the road out there and that they should be abiding by them. Um, other entities say that's really not as clear as he makes it sound. Uh, and he's taking a lot of action through, you know, through regulation. So it's, it's coming out, excuse me, through enforcement. So we don't like when rules are introduced into the marketplace through, you know, legal actions. Uh, so that's something that he gets the most pushback on. Doesn't mean people want them to kind of just set a path and let people follow it, right? Yeah, As yeah. opposed to what you're mentioning there, kind of picking and choosing your enforcement battles and letting the marketplace just interpret what that means. It does seem like there's a little bit of a challenge for the folks in that space. Let's pivot to happier stuff, Jim. Yes. Let's get excited here. I know you guys, when you're not down here at OIC, are, are holding a bunch of your own events. You have a big event coming up in October we're going to get to in a second. But I know you just had a, your own virtual event recently. What were some of the highlights that you want to share with our listeners from that event? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the the highlights that we had on it, l- listen, this is the first full year that, that most associations are having, the first full year of, of a post-COVID environment. And and I think it's not just us. I think it's a lot of associations are, uh, I think, a lot of the lessons learned um, from, you know, the COVID and being able to uh, balance the, you know, the good things about doing things on a virtual basis. The, you know, there's a lot of good in that. But that there is a definitely a, a resurgence of people understanding and appreciating the value of uh, in-person events. And, and it seems that that is uh, we're going to have our first full year of that among STA and all its affiliates, and we're and we're, we're excited about that. We're optimistic about it. The 
you know, we have these 20 affiliates in the U.S. and four up in Canada. They all hold events of all different sizes, and they're getting well. They're getting well attended. They're getting well supported, and, and we couldn't be happier for them. And uh, and and you know, we ourselves too. We we have a virtual event that we did uh, last week, and then we have our big in-person event, which will be a hybrid in October. And and uh, you know, it's I think it, like I said, it's the first full year where you're kind of striking that balance of how much of this do we want to do virtually. How much do we want to do in person? They both have value to it, but you don't want to do too much of one versus the other. Let's get into the mothership, the big event that I know is a lot of the focus of your planning uh, throughout the year, the October STA Market Structure Conference. What's on the agenda? What can we look forward to this year, Jim? Yeah, so so we'll, we'll start planning that aggressively, um, like, you know, May 1st, which is next week <laughs> as far as, but, but, you know, we, we're going to wrap up the one, the event we just did in April here. But uh, listen, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, these four rule proposals that were dropped in December, just to put them in perspective, to put it in perspective, the last time the SEC did something like this was in this time period of, 20, of the year 2000 to 2005. All right. So there, there hasn't been, you know, sometimes we get inundated with all these rules. We, we, don't, we, we lose perspective as far as, you know, what's important and what is not. Th- these rules are important because it's the first time they've done something like this, you know, in 15, 17 years. OK, so they will definitely be on the agenda and then options will be on the agenda for sure. Digital assets will be on the agenda for sure. And then we'll be taking it from the buy side, the broker deals, exchanges and, and vendor space. So it, it'll be a very broad, you know, attendee list again. Well, we're looking forward to another fun event in October. And, Jim, if folks want to check out what you have cooking for the October event, soon to be planned, or, or indeed any of the other events you and the affiliates have, where should they go? What should they do? They, they can check us out on, on our website, securitytraders.org, securitytraders.org. Um, you know, we're out there on, on uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's becoming a very big platform for us lately. Uh, you know, 33,000 people on our email list, another 25,000 through our LinkedIn accounts. It's, you know, it's, it's, we're pretty happy with how that, that's been going. So, uh, yeah, you can check us out on, on our LinkedIn or, or on our website. Before we wrap up, too, I know you had a great program you guys have been doing over there for a couple of years now, offering free or reduced yeah. price tickets to people in the industry who have yeah. been affected by some of the change that's going on. Are, are you still offering that? Yeah, so that's called our STAR program, and, and I'm really th- – thank you for asking about it because we are proud about that, that we've been able to do that consistently since the, since the first time we announced it, right? So it is a package that, um, you know, usually like in August, uh, July-ish, we'll say, we'll, we'll go out with a notice saying that if you're in between jobs, you can put your name in here, and, and you know, we, we pick, uh, you know, 10 names where it's, you know, we pay for the travel, the hotel, and the ticket to come down. You can network at it um we are going to do it this year we are going to do it this year again like we always have i think there's more of a need for it this year than than last year to be honest with you last year you know here's what we've always done we probably in the years we've done we probably would average 40 to 50 people would submit their names and then we would pick 10 and then we would offer the other then we tell the other people Listen, I, you know, I'm sorry you didn't get the package, but if you can get yourself down to D.C., there's, there's a name badge with your name on it, right? Well, I don't, we've never said no to anybody as far as at least giving them a ticket to the conference. Um, last year was a record low, and I think it's because the job market was pretty healthy. Uh, this year, I, I don't, I'm going to forecast that, unfortunately, I think the number is going to be higher this year. Well, Jim, that's a great program. I'm glad to see you guys yeah. are keeping it up over there. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys put together for your upcoming big event in October. Thanks for having us. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.